Hello ladies and gents, welcome to CG Reactions and this is Unbass History The Severan Dynasty by the channel Jove Hachi. This is the 13th video out of the 19 video series and uh, last video we saw the end of Pax Romana, the great time of Roman civilization. So it's now just downfall from here. Yeah, we are going to witness the end of uh, you know, Roman civilization soon. Uh, in the last video, we saw how you know uh, Trajan uh, was uh, one of the greatest emperor of all time, expanded the Roman uh, civilization a lot. He he was uh, revered by a lot of people. Uh, he was considered as great as you know Augustus. Obviously, uh, we also saw Hadrian. <laughs> <laughs> he just basically killed all the Jews, tons of them. Uh, you know, Rovetti was making jokes about him in the past videos. I, I didn't caught about it first, but then I'm like, oh damn, this is that guy. And at, at the first, I'm like, hmm, he's, he's creating all this infrastructure, he's creating all these uh, bridges and things. He's going to be all, you know, managing this, uh, you, know, you know, industrialized uh, leader kind of thing. But no, nope, in the end, he got pissed off and killed lots of Jews. Uh, lots of people said that Commodus one was, uh, you know, uh, not true, was from the movie. I didn't realize that because I didn't know if that movie is true or fictional. So, you know, obviously I bought into it like this is true, but apparently it's not. That was a joke. Um, Maximus doesn't exist. He's a fictional character. Hmm. I didn't know that. I said it in the past. I don't know much about Roman history. Come on, man. So in this one, I th uh, you know, the, he's going to correct it and uh, uh, correct it you know in correct enough he's gonna correct enough in this one and just move on from uh, you know what actually happened so yeah let's watch the video Last time, on Unbiased History. After Marcus Aurelius had died of the Antonine Plague, he left the empire to his Chad son, Commodus. Being a divine incarnation and a perfect athlete, Commodus dominated the gladiatorial arena for 15 glorious years, gaining the envy and hate of senators and praetorians alike. After yet another assassination attempt on their part, coming as poison from his own lover no less, he vomited it all out and went to his personal bath. His enemies then bribed his wrestling mate, Narcissus, to finish the job and after a long struggle, killing Commodus. Ha, <laughs> just fucking kidding. The historian Ridley Scott already debunked all this garbage, and with the Antonine Dynasty and the Empire now in shambles thanks to Commodus, if she I knew it! I was the right one and you all people were wrong. Ridley Scott and the Gladiator movie is canon. That actually happened. Do it is that right there? <laughs> you recall what happened after the julio claudian Dynasty ended, you'll know it's time for a year of not four, but five emperors. You see, the Praetorians just didn't have the Emperor killed without thinking of the repercussions, they would never do that. Instead they dragged Pertinax to fill the void. After making him promise a huge fucking bribe to, they then forced the Senate to ratify him as Emperor, something they wanted to do anyway, and things looked good to be honest. Pertinax started to rebalance the economy, issue fair laws, and began restoring discipline to the Praetorian Guard. <laughs> yeah, about that. As he started paying out their bribes, the Imperial Treasury was emptied. Zero gold left. Nothing. Commodus had wasted it all. And when he explained that he could only pay half of what he was forced to promise, the Praetorians chipped out in rage. They constantly demanded the rest of the bribe, threatening to revolt several times, but there was nothing to pay them with, so Pertinax refused. Blaming everything on Pertinax, 300 of the most corrupt Praetorians invaded the Imperial Palace to hunt him down. 
Their prefect, a scourge named Elidas, was sent to calm them down, but instead joined and led them towards the Emperor's office. Betrayed by his men, Pertinax then confronted them himself and urged them to think about what they were doing. Here they were, the Emperor's own bodyguards, threatening him with violence over money. Money he didn't have for no fault of his own. Through a long speech, he gave them the chance to set aside their rage so that they could work together and to ensure the Empire's cross. I knew it. So after killing Pertinax. These Praetorian gods are supposed to be gods for the emperors. They've killed more emperors than anybody in the history. Why, is they, why are they still a thing? Why is next emperor coming and saying, fuck all of you. You're all fired or killed or something. This is weird, man. Every time these assholes kills emperors. Just for their own benefits. Next, Lilus thought of a plan to both name a new emperor and far more to the point, get all that money they wanted. A plan so disgusting, immoral and vile it provokes anger at the mere thought of it. They would sell the empire. You got to be kidding leader. me. Meanwhile, an extremely rich man named Daedus Julianus was eating dinner with his family. And when news that the empire was for fucking sale arrived, he hesitated, but his greedy wife and daughter forced him out of the house to go buy it. And that's what he did, getting to the Praetorian camp and outbeating Pertinax's father-in-law with 25,000 sisters his worth of bribes. The Praetorians then forced the Senate to ratify their new emperor. Alright, I don't get this. How can one man be so rich he can buy an entire Roman Empire? How does that? First of all, how did these gods put it on oxen? How did people, senate and everybody didn't go ape shit with that one? How are there are no some legionnaires there somewhere who's just, you know, strong and they're like, you know what, enough of this, I'm gonna revolt and take the empire for myself. How did they go with this thing? And on top of all that, how does one man have enough money to buy an entire empire? Can anybody buy America right now, USA? They would need trillions. Nobody has trillions. How can somebody have more money than empire does that they can buy an empire? That doesn't make sense to me. Again, and things didn't look good at all. Here's the thing. The provincial governors were more than happy with Pertinax taking over after Commodus. But Julianus, some literal who with no connection to the Antonines, that was buying power, that's something neither Piscinius Niger in Syria, Clodius Albinus in Britannia, nor Septimius Severus in were willing to accept. There you go. Reasons. I knew that was gonna happen. How the hell can you just buy an empire and people like, what the hell just happened? Piscinius Niger was everyone's favorite to take over power, much like Vespasian, commanding the Eastern Legions and all. Clodius Albinus had revolted against Commodus a few years earlier, now taking Pertinax's death to follow on his proclaimed wish to restore the Republic or some such nonsense. A wish revealed false after he accepted Severus' offer to become his subordinate heir. And as far as Severus could see, it was left to him to save the Empire from those idiots. His origins date back to the destruction of Carthage, as several Roman settlers began to colonize the <laughs> That's... that's... <laughs> this mountain of salt! <laughs> that's Carthage, oh my god, this is awesome! Consulted lands through the centuries, among them the Severans. Despite the Marcomannic Wars and the Antonine Plague in his way, Severus climbed to the Crucis Honorum quickly. And after his wife died, Severus was told by an astrologer of a woman in the East destined to marry a king. He then tracked her down, Julia Domna was her name, being descended from one of the client kings Pompey had once set up, and a daughter of the High Priest of Soul. Coincidence? I fucking think not. With her, Severus had his first son, Bassianus. They are nicknamed Caracalla after a Gallic cloak that he wore. And then a second one named Geta, a failed progeny, but such were the times. Julia Domina. Alright, people are just coming there, strong arming people and just becoming emperor. That can last. This, uh, you know, Severin was a, you know, intelligent man. He first married somebody who had some connections so that he can pretend that, he, you know, he has connections to become emperor and he slowly built from there. This is the way to become emperor, so people can, you know, see like, hmm, he's an emperor material there. Also had a sister, Julia Mesa, whom also had two children, Julia Suemis and Julia Mamia. Yeah, I know, they just love that first name. After receiving Marcus Aurelius' respect, Severus would then spend his days cleaning up after Commodus's mess, being eventually appointed to Pannonia, where he commanded three veteran legions, and where he received news of Pertinax's death. Duty bound to oust the usurper, Severus marched south and occupied a growing city called Ravenna, where the imperial fleet was stationed. As a response, Julius forced the senate to declare Severus an enemy of the state, sending several assassins disguised as diplomats to kill him. 
but whenever they got there, the moment they made eye contact with him, they either shit their pants or joined his side, often both. Despised by all except the Praetorians that he brought. Okay, I see what happened there. It's not like, oh my god, he saw it doesn't look like a Voldemort or something that they just saw him and got afraid. I think they saw how, what uh, measures he was taking, marrying into family that could help him become emperor. He was building things towards to become an emperor. So they saw that uh, he's, he's really strong in that area. So they thought, hmm, it's better to align with him. Five, Julianus sent them to defeat Severus getting all annihilated by him. I don't know what he was expecting. Severus then camped outside Rome, and instead of taking it by force, he sent an ultimatum for the Praetorians to deliver Lidus and all the Praetorians who partook in killing Pertinax. Yeah. The comrades betrayed them in a second, and Severus had them all executed. Julianus was later Fuck dragged him. to a dark room, and before being executed, he cried, But what evil have I done? Whom have I killed? And I can answer that. One, listening to his wife, and two, by consequence, himself. The Senate then recognized. All right. First of all, he he is at a fault somewhat. If somebody comes to you, do you want to buy an empire? And he's like, Yeah, I have money. You are just as to blame, man. You should have refused. I mean, you know, th th that was just stupid. Of course, people are going to retaliate. Severus as the new emperor. Not that he cared. In such times of absolute political corruption and decadence, the army was the only institution that mattered. And to further this point, Severus had all remaining members of the Praetorian Guard line up, confiscating their property and wealth, exiling them all, and filling it up with four times more men, now that's all better. veterans from his legions, and giving them all the assets he seized. That settled, Severus gathered his legions to deal with Piscinius Niger in Syria, whom, after a few months after Pertinax's death, had moved from Antioch to Bithynia. In the same time, Severus had marched south, deposed Julianus, rested a bit, sailed west, and arrived in Bithynia. After a few of skirmishes, Niger made a last stand at Isis, where he hoped to larp as Alexander as he defeated the Persians there hundreds of years ago. Instead, he played the part of the Persian king, getting absolutely trashed and fleeing the battlefield towards the nearest city he could. With the gods, or clearly something against him, he was later captured and killed. But Severus then had to deal with the last of Niger's strongholds, a small, irrelevant village called... what? Byzantium, was it? Yeah, yeah, something like that. And irrelevant, so of course. Just how fucking hard it was to siege it. It took Severus two fucking years to finally capture it, and it made him so mad he ordered all fortifications of the city destroyed, hoping of course it would be forgotten to time. And when you make... It's like two goddamn years, 365 days, do you know this is so effing boring? There is nothing to do here. You made me wait two years. Destroy everything. Bad is angry. The consequences are severe. For the Parthians, most of all, he just invaded them with no warning, killed a bunch of barbarians to vent off, then returned to the empire. Speaking of barbarians, Severus had camped his legions on Thrace on his way to Rome, which is where his pleb soldiers kept being bested in sports by a local Romano Thracian teenager. Defeating all his pleb troops of ease and rivaling his best men with his 8 feet stature, the young Maximinus Frax took over the Emperor's horse, demanding to be led into the legions. He lacked discipline, but the legions were already mostly plebs anyway, so why not? Back in Rome, Severus relayed his victories in the east to Albinus in Britannia, and bored out of his mind in that shitty island, he invented some bullshit about Severus having tried to murder him, blah 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 blah, revolting against him and taking over Lugdunum in Gaul. With I'm sure that was his bullshit, news, not true. Severus named his eldest son Caracalla as his heir, and set off for the north. Albinus' strategy to win relied entirely on bribing the Rhine legions to his side, but thanks to the disciplining legacy of both Domitian and Hadrian, they refused. Once Severus arrived at Lugdunum with 150,000 men, he found Albinus with an equal force to match, starting the greatest legion-on-legion -legion battle in Roman history. After two days of brutal fighting, and Severus focusing on his shitty troops on the left, his true soldiers on the right broke through the enemy lines, and some opportunist named Julius Leader stole the credit for it. Coincidence? No fucking way. Much like Niger, Albinus fled to the nearest city he could, but this time, he spared everyone the trouble and just killed himself. Severus then walked over his desecrated corpse, cutting off his head and sending it to Rome, alongside his limbs and those of his family. Having won the civil war, Severus ordered an empire-wide purge of all supporters of Niger and Albinus, killing some 30 senators in the process, and giving all their property to his soldiers, then doubling their annual pay for good measure. His reasoning being that he could either bribe his pleb legions into compliance at the expense of the economy to prevent any revolts, or he could rely on the senate's wise administration to ensure peace in the province. That was smart, man, because 
uh, you know, uh, old Praetorian guards were constantly killing emperors, so he just wiped them out and replaced it with his own men. Uh, he couldn't rely on senators or anybody because they were just treacherous as well. So he just uh, gathered up his loyal people, just paid them to, you know, make them powerful and not rely on anyone else. Killed lots of senators who could have opposed him because, let's be honest, you know, assassination were becoming way too common. So he was just being smart there. Fat fucking chance. So he debased the currency to pay what he needed, which would become a standard practice. And it hadn't Damn. taken even a couple of years before his new Praetorians started getting filled with corrupted plebs. As their prefect, Plotianus, would soon show. Predictably, Severus found the administrative life of an emperor absolute torture. Caught between correcting for the senate's incompetence, the plebs' idiocy, and the Praetorian guards' growing corruption, he decided to do what he was best at, fucking off to the provinces and killing Rome's enemies. Getting back to Parthia, again, after they decided to mass their armies for an upcoming invasion. But Severus... You know what, that's why past emperors of any kingdom always are at the war, because they, they would rather be at war than listen to the plebs, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> saw through their shit, preemptively invading and ransacking his way down the Euphrates, a Roman tradition by this point. And after Julius Leaders failed repeatedly to take the city of Hatra, along with plenty of insubordination on his part, Severus had him executed, and then personally tortured the inhabitants of Hatra with a long siege, annexing all of the surrounding areas of northern Mesopotamia and letting them stay abandoned in a sea of red. Now here's something both neat and depressing. Severus also expanded the empire deep into the desert, asserting dominance over several oasis cities, such as Palmyra. There he met a single civilized noble family, which so impressed him that he gave them Roman citizenship as well as his first name. And here is where the Odinaphus family started out. The depressing part will come later. And to celebrate his victory, Severus ordered built the Ark of Septimius Severus in Rome. I told you people would copy Titus, Severus was just the first one. Around this time, a lot of Christians would be persecuted. Not for Severus' doing though, he adhered to Trajan's policy of meh towards them, getting bored at the mere mention of their crucified Jew. So to cure that, he returned to his home in Africa, campaigning deep into the Sahara, expanding the empire to protect his home city of Leptis Magna. Meanwhile, Claudianus was playing the part of Sejanus, abusing power, demanding personal loyalty, thinking himself the hot shit and all the rest. Back in Rome again to oversee his unimportant brother's last moments, he testified against Plotianus' crimes as prefect, dying shortly after. It was then that Caracal approached his father, warning him of a Praetorian plot Plotianus was crafting against him. The Severans then faced Plotianus, striked him down, and ordered his execution. Once dead, Slapped and his family exiled to Sicily, the full burden of the state fell on Severus once more driving him so suicidally angry that when news came that the Picts were stirring up trouble in the north, Severus took the chance for one last campaign. But that was the last nail in the coffin, both for Severus' patience and his life. The moment he arrived in Caledonia, after rebuilding Antonine's wall and marching south, the Picts fled to the highlands like the cowards they've always been. Such was their cowardice, in fact, that not only did they only attack when the Romans weren't looking, but they abandoned their women and children in the lowlands. Furious to the core at their cowardice, Damn. Severus became yet another emperor to advocate barbarism. How after his death, they just moved up, you know, upland and they just left all the women and children? That's just fucked up, man. Maybe they were thinking of, you know, strategizing something. They didn't know the Romans would arrive this early. That could, that's the only explanation I can think of. Otherwise, they just sacrificed the women and children. That's just effed up. Barbarian genocide, ordering the absolute slaughter of the pigs with his immortal words. Let none escape sheer destruction, not even the babe in the womb of the mother. And while he carried on genociding the Picts, Geta was offering the more corruptible plebeian soldiers with bribes to gain their support. His patience exhausted with such matters, Severus rewrote his will to make both of his sons emperors, on the condition that they were harmonious with each other, paid heed only to the legions, Clemens. and never ever care about what the senate or anyone else thinks. His succession settled, Severus chose to take a drastic decision. He died, and thus Caracalla and his younger brother Geta were acclaimed to the co-emperors of Rome. But here's the thing, Geta hated Caracalla. Busy with restoring order to the empire, Severus had no time to raise his children. Caracalla embraced his father's harsh virtues, but Geta had become nothing but yet another hedonist prince, and while the eldest loved his brother, it was never reciprocal. Geta never spoke to him, slept, ate and lived as far away from his brother as possible, always surrounded by guards and suspicious 24-7. 
Some have suggested that they split the empire between themselves. Caracalla got the west and Geta got the east. But the former refused. It was a really stupid idea. Seriously, what kind of retard would permanently split the empire between two brothers like that? Stupid. So stupid. So the feud was left to be resolved by their mother Domna, whom dragged both of them into the same room to talk unarmed. You know, it was the typical drivel, you're brothers, you're supposed to love yourselves, violence is not the answer, blah blah blah. A speech so boring and annoying to hear that a guard standing outside just stormed in without orders and murdered Geta in front of her. Absolutely devastated at his brother's death, yeah, Karakal right, okay. called on his other Praetorians to deal with his brother's assassins. And once he finally calmed down, he assumed the unwanted burden of being the Soul Emperor, to show his love for his deceit. Yeah, bullshit. He had, him, he had his brother killed. That's damn sure. <laughs> his brother, Caracalla ordered all plebs who had ever negatively influenced Geta to be executed, killing tens of thousands of plebs in the first year of his reign. For now Caracalla held nothing in his heart but disdain for plebs. To start out his reign, he had the homes and businesses of thousands of plebs in Rome demolished, and in their place he ordered the baths of Caracalla to be built, by far the best of its kind to ever grace the Eternal City. Shame it was flooded by plebs. Next, he ordered an edict that made every single man in the Empire a Roman citizen. Yes, all pleb men were citizens now. Just so that now they were forced to pay taxes. The fucking madman. They weren't before? So plebs weren't considered citizens, that's just effed up. After having his former wife strangled in Sicily and erasing all mentions and portrayals of Geta in monuments in which he didn't look very good, all of them that is, Caracalla sought to emulate Hadrian and travel through the provinces of the Empire. And as Hadrian did, starting in the Rhine, where he crushed an incoming Alemanni invasion, taking the title of Alemannicus Germanicus. As he continued his travels, he demanded that all cities he passed through kill Germans and he have the title of Germanicus, isn't it? Build great monuments in his honor at their own expense. And once they were finished, he either ignored them or ordered them destroyed for not being up to his standards. He then held massive parties, hoarding all of the city's food and inviting no one to them. And on that topic, he only ate fish food when it was far enough inland that it became an expensive commodity, demanding luxurious seafood for dinner and executing all plebs who didn't comply. One day, one of Pertinax's sons had the audacity to call Caracalla Gaticus, implying that he killed his own beloved brother. Safe to say such insults didn't go unpunished. As he left the west, he extended his disdain to the barbarians in the east, demanding several high-ranking Dacians to be taken hostage and imprisoning the Armenian king to emulate Trajan, and then setting sail to the vital province of Egypt, but to his dismay, once he arrived, the citizens of Alexandria saw fit to welcome their emperor with a play that mocked his brother's death, spreading the abhorrent lie that it was him that killed Geta. That made him very angry. And when you make Caracalla angry, well, tens of thousands of plebs were then slaughtered in Alexandria. The city set ablaze and the legions allowed to plunder it at will. Yeah, he's a, he's a crazy emperor who killed his own brother and killing, uh, you know, uh, the plebs left and right. Yeah, let's make fun of him in theater. And yeah, let's see what happens. That was immensely stupid. As he reported his deeds to the Senate, he told them nothing but the truth. It was the whole city of Alexandria that was guilty. Yeah, damn. Persecuting Greek white philosophers just because he could. Not that he really cared about what the Senate thought. Being a true son of Severus, he gave only the legions his attention, raising their salaries and giving several surprise bonuses so that civil war was an impossibility. And with the empire now prospering thanks to him, Caracalla was greeted by the Parthian king. After centuries of getting their teeth kicked in by the Romans, the Parthians came to negotiate an alliance, through an arranged marriage no less. Caracalla agreed, traveling with his family and men to Tessaphon, where he married the Parthian princess, ushering a new era of peace and tolerance between Romans and Parthians. <laughs> no, 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 no. He ordered the whole Parthian wedding party slaughtered, set Tessaphon ablaze, then ransacked his way back to the empire, renaming himself Parthicus as the whole of Parthia. What in the blue hell, man? That was out of blue? God damn, he just killed them? <laughs> man, he's crazy and now bowed at his feet. But behind every good emperor, there's a treacherous Praetorian itching to betray him. Yeah, Macrinus, good and case. treacherous, of course. What triggered this particular Praetorian prefect to act against Caracalla was that an astrologer had begun prophesizing that he would one day become emperor. At first he reacted like a coward, doing everything he could to shut the astrologer up, to no avail. So then he took the treacherous option, 
A chill afternoon in the desert, as Carcalla was looking for a place to piss in the sand, Macrinus approached a disgruntled soldier whom the Emperor had denied the promotion to Centurion earlier. Step by step, he neared Caracalla. Macrinus telling the other Praetorians everything was fine, and before Caracalla knew it, he was being backstabbed to death. The assassin was then shot down, but too little, too late. Now, we've been here before. With the Praetorians having killed the Emperor, Macrinus, after failing to find... Alright, the Emperor was an asshole, but still, again, Praetorian killing Emperor again. Why are there such things as Praetorians anymore? Why are they not getting disbanded? This is crazy. They're supposed to protect the Emperor, and yet they're killing more Emperors than anybody else. Did anyone to buy the position with bribes, he did the next worst thing, and just took the position for himself. And the Senate did their duty to recognize as Emperor whatever man the Praetorians forced them to. But that didn't mean that the Severan family would roll with it. Julia Domna, on one hand, refused to be exiled from Rome, going on a hunger strike and starving herself to death. On the other hand, her sister, Julia Mesa, conspired to have one of her grandsons be her puppets to take back power. Either of them would do in her eyes, so she chose the eldest among them, Elegabalus. To kick things off, she revealed that Elegabalus was actually the bastard son of Caracalla, and thus the rightful heir to the Empire. Once the news reached one of the Eastern Legions, they instantly revolted in favor of Elegabalus, all while Macrinus was busy sucking up to all of Rome's enemies, returning the Dacian hostages, appointing the imprisoned Armenian king's son to take his father's place, and even paying off the Parthians not to attack him, only oh. then hearing of what was happening. How the mighty have fallen, paying off people so they don't attack them? That's Rome now, goddamn. In Syria. He then sent his Praetorians to deal with them, but instead got all annihilated. Deja vu. Left abandoned, Macrinus mustered what troops he still had left to confront the rebelling legion. As they battled, Elagabalus bravely charged through enemy lines to rally the Eagle Standard, routing the enemy forces, including Macrinus, whom then fled to the battlefield. He was later found in Cappadocia and executed by the resurgent Severans. He was the first emperor to have never set foot in Rome while in office. You... you get used to it. On that matter, and would you believe, the Senate bowed down to their newly proclaimed emperor. Didn't see that one fucking coming. And he was even so kind as to order a huge portrait of himself hanged on the Senate's walls, coupled with a statue of Victoria, goddess of victory. What kind of portrait is that? Ride. Simply said, Elegabalus was the opposite of Hadrian on the faggotry spectrum. For royal hatred, <laughs> like the dude he took a liking to, <laughs> Elegabalus let himself be fucked by any masculine dude who liked him. A true bottom's bottom, a sub comes lot through and through, you get it. But there's a very good reason for all this degeneracy. Having been born and raised at the service of the ancient solar deity, Elegabalus served him like no other. Such was his piety, that one day he was granted an enlightening vision. After centuries of Roman virtues being diluted by plebs and barbarians alike, the original Trojan virtues of the old Romans was drowned in a sea of degeneracy, such as Christ Mercury. This in turn weakened the gods to such a state that Elagabalus was able to glimpse at their true nature. Throughout all of Roman history, from the monarchs, republicans and emperors thereafter, its greatest heroes were blessed by soul for various means. Focusing the praise for all of Rome's gods into one, he merged their qualities into one divine essence. Ay, 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 ay. Deus Sol Invictus, the overarching divinity composing all of Rome's deities, and thus, the one true god. After making this cataclysmic discovery, the cult named Elagabalus their Grand Priest, which is where he adopted that name, by the way. Unfortunately, matters of deep theology were often too much to understand, especially to a mere plebeian's mind. So Elagabalus, learning of the degenerate cesspool Rome became while being dragged around by his grandmother, he chose to fight degeneracy with degeneracy. To ensure no one could ignore his divine message, Elagabalus indulged in the most obscene, debauched taboos in Roman society. Not only did he dress, act and speak like a woman, but an unashamed whore. Not only making sure everyone knew he got fucked daily by his slave chariot driver, Hierocles, but expressing delight every time he was called Hierocles' queen. During the night, he stood naked outside his bedroom, soliciting any passerby to come fuck him hard in his bed. At dinner, he served his guests delicacies like camel hooves and parrot brains, and if they didn't eat it, he released lions to eat them instead. Whenever in a high place, he threw gold at the streets to watch the plebs kill each other over it. In the imperial palace, he had big-tittied women stripped naked and forced to push his chariot around oh my being God. 
and big dicked men organized in lines according to their dick size and giving them government positions to match. And one day he ordered that a lion, a monkey and a snake be thrown together into a dark room and threw the genitals of his executed enemies in it. Why you ask? Well, he never did. Well, when your grandmother just, you know, makes you in power just because she wants to be in power, there's lots of psychological issues that are gonna come up and that's what we are witnessing right now. Massive psychological issues. Damn, this is just effed up. <laughs> give a reason. This outrageous behavior for an emperor had everyone's eyes on him, which was precisely the point. Having finally gained their attention, Elegablos then began spreading the word of Sol Invictus, that all Roman gods were but partial derivations from his divinity, and that the end of the world was nigh. <laughs> nah, nah, he didn't share that with them. Included in his religious reforms was that no god could be worshipped without first praising the sun, although he did take some getting used to it. Paramount to his reforms were the triumph-like festivals of a divine black meteorite representing Sol Invictus, which was paraded around in a glorious chariot for all to admire. And finally, the creation of a special festival date dedicated for Deus Sol Invictus, celebrated every winter solstice at the 25th of December in place of Saturnalia, which would become so popular that the Christ cooks would steal it for themselves centuries. Oh, so he did that. All right. So, uh, you know, Saturnalia 25th December, okay, he did that. Years later, being righteously forced to participate in such festivals, at the threat of being crushed under a giant mount of flowers, the senators and praetorians grew to hate Elegabalus. It also didn't help when he took a vestal virgin as his wife, among the five or so wives he had in total, and I'm not making this up, asking his doctors for a sex change operation, but that proved yeah, I think the Saturnalia thing, I think it's because, you know, sun goes uh, lower and lower and lower at the horizon around that time. And then he starts to come back up again. That's why they pray, you know, pray to the sun or something. I think that's what the uh, detail about it was. But I don't know. I'm not sure. It should be too much, even for him. What also didn't help was that Julia Maisa had been using her grandson's authority to grab as much power for her as possible, even forcing herself into Senate hearings. A woman in the Senate. Now that's fucking blasphemy. No wonder Elagabalus wished to replace them all with woman. Might as well at this point. And good thing that Elagabalus never served as the puppet her grandmother wanted. Completely autonomous in his religious mission, Mesa was then forced to rely on Alexander Severus and his mother Julia Mamia to ensure her position. Securing the fact that Alexander was far easier to manipulate, she tricked Elagabalus into naming him his heir, while he didn't have any sons of his own. He would only later find out it was part of her plot to kill him. After assassination attempt after assassination attempt later, all coming from the Praetorians and masterminded by Mesa, Elegabalus dodged them all, and as punishment revoked Alexander's status as imperial heir. And just to fuck with them, he spread the rumor Alexander was near death, triggering Mesa and thus the Praetorians immensely. After showing them Alexander to reveal everything was fine, the Praetorians acclaimed him as Caesar. Elegabalus then stepped up, ordering the execution of all who did so. And with his mother by his side, the Praetorians then encircled the young emperor, murdering them both right then and there. Why is it that divine emperors only rule for a couple of- Wait a minute, so she kill her grandson and her daughter? God damn, that's some power hungry thing right there. Years, I wonder. With his rule ended and body thrown to the Tiber River, Elegabalus' cousin Alexander was acclaimed the new emperor. I'm gonna cry a lot editing the next episode. But the qualities that made Alexander such a good puppet also made him a cowardly crybaby. His mother, Mamia, knew that well. So to try and blur the fact Rome was now at the mercy of her puppet, she compensated by organizing an advisory council led by the two senators still worth a damn in the senate. Those being Opian, the greatest Roman jurist of all time, named as Praetorian Prefect, and none other than Cassius Dio, one of Rome's greatest historians and a vicious humorist. After Mesa's undeservedly peaceful death and the burden of state laid on their shoulders, let me guess they're gonna kill the emperor and become emperor of their own selves. Hmm. They set about reducing taxes on the provinces, revaluing the currency, and restoring discipline to the Praetorians. And God, why do people even try that anymore? Exactly. The Praetorians, predictably, abhorred the mere thought of them not doing whatever they wanted without repercussions. And with Opian leading such an effort, they sought to kill him. The bravest Roman citizens tried to stop them, but the Praetorians just carved through them, invading the Imperial Palace and murdering Opian at the feet of Alexander, who was too weak to stop them. 
And on the topic of Alexander's weakness, his mother Mamia had just arranged him a marriage with a daughter of a senator. But once Alex started spending time with his wife, Mamia felt her influence over him threatened, so she accused her father of conspiring against the emperor, ordering his death and the exile of his daughter to Syria. God much damn. like Tiberius' early reign, Alex was plagued with legionary revolts left and right. No one wanted to swear allegiance to some mama's boy, much less with him reducing their payments. His Severan predecessors were right all along, as it turns out. And then the last leg of his administration, Cassius Dio, also became the target of the Praetorian's rage, with his sarcastic comments leaving nothing to the imagination. Once more, being too weak to defend his advisor, Alex had Cassius Dio exiled to Bithynia, where he finished his historical works and told us about all the drama from his time. And not that far from Bithynia, we return to Parthia, not for war, but to say goodbye to their crumbling dynasty. Well, I can already see the fall of Rome already. If your emperor is this weak and just a puppet, yeah, you're about to fall, man. Obviously, people are going to revolt now because nobody wants to see as emperor as that. Damn, first of all, she killed her, you know, grandson and her daughter just because of power. Then, you know, appointed this mama's boy on the power and now everything's gonna fall apart. I can already see it. The details of barbarian politics bore me, so I'll be brief. After centuries of getting bashed by Rome, the Parthians became weak and found themselves in another civil war between two brothers. While they fought, an ancient evil had been brewing. So ancient evil. There, a brutal barbarian rebelled and summoned his legions from the underworld, crushing a punitive army and then a second one led by one of the brothers, later hunting the second one down. Crowning himself the king of kings and the first emperor of the Sassanid dynasty, Ardashir desired one thing only, the destruction of Rome. Once Alex heard news of the eastern hordes gathering near Mesopotamia, he sent endless envoys to try and negotiate a peace. But peace was a foreign concept to such a manifestation of pure evil. In exchange for such a mm, peace, oh, Ardashir demanded all of Rome's eastern provinces so that he could bask in the blood of its innocent civilians. Obviously, with the legates forcing his mother to refuse, she then forced his son to go to war. Gathering most of the Rhine and Danube legions to the east, Alex planned a three-way invasion from the north, south and at the center, led by himself. But as both wings were accomplishing their objectives, Alex abandoned his invasion out of pure cowardice. Oh my god. Alex endless hordes to overwhelm the sovereign legion. How mighty has fallen, I mean really, god damn, this is Rome? <laughs> Oh my god. Thus forcing the northern legions to march back through the Armenian mountains on winter. Being completely at fault for the deaths of countless of his soldiers, Alex was lucky to realize Arisha became very busy eating the flesh of the plebeian soldiers he killed to wage war anymore. So Alex just declared victory and left. Mirroring Marcus Aurelius' Parthian war, being forced to relocate to the Rhine and Danube legions, the Germans raided the empire, there you killing go. the defenseless families of many legionnaires. Enraged at the Princeps' cowardice, their family's deaths, and the fact that not only was their emperor controlled by his mother, but a stingy autocrat that made them live in slave-like conditions, loyalty became rarer and rarer. The final straw came when Alex arrived in the Rhine, and instead of beating the Germans back to their mud huts, he offered them even more golden rewards oh my God. would be so kind as to leave, as they continued to slaughter the civilians and burn the cities. Enough was The more he does that, the more his message is sending that Rome is not what it used to be. So everybody's going to attack now. Enough. All they needed was a leader. Which gets us back to Maximinus Frax, by then a legate and a respected trainer of recruits. As he walked in to eat breakfast, the legions acclaimed him the new emperor like it was a surprise party. Taken aback, but understanding their motivations, Frax accepted the title and ordered his centurions to realize the wishes of every soldier present. Finding him in the imperial tent, together with his mother laying on her hoarded wealth, the centurions had them both executed. With him died the Severan dynasty, and unbeknownst to the soldiers, Rome as we know it. For when the legions got rid of such a weak emperor, it was an order they invited back, but chaos. The following decades would be filled with war, pestilence, death, and much, much worse. Only a miracle will save Rome from what's to come. Here starts the crisis of the third century. God damn. Seven Dynasty started with the promise that Rome can be great again, but ended with even worse. Mama's boy, who just basically tried to peace, you know, peace talk everyone, tried to give money to Germans. 
is basically giving the message man we are weak attack us god damn where the rome was just the roman emperor just coming there with blankets and people ran away now they are giving bribes and you know peace talks and now the crisis of the third century what the hell is that i guess the worst times are coming now huh damn this was a this was a heavy video man rome's fall is apparent now all right people if you like my reaction don't forget to like and subscribe